Hello everyone and welcome to AASC's webinar, Alternate Methods of Connection Design, presented by Patrick McManus and Larry Muir. Today is May 14, 2015. My name is Christina Harbour and I am with AASC's Continuing Education Group and I will be moderating today's presentation. I want to introduce today's speakers. Our first speaker is Larry Muir. Mr. Muir is the Director of Technical Assistance at AISC, where he oversees the operations of the technical aspects of the AISC Steel Solutions Center. He is the 2014 AISC T.R. Higgins Lectureship Award winner. Our second speaker is Patrick McManus. Dr. McManus is a principal at Martin & Martin, Wyoming. He earned his structural engineering doctorate, master's, and bachelor's degrees in architectural engineering from the University of Wyoming. As an expert in the principles of modern steel design, seismic design, and detailing in design build projects, he's involved with the firm's steel design build and construction services pursuits. And with that, I will hand things over to Larry. Thank you. Um, so today we're going to be talking about alternate methods of connection design. And uh, the talk sort of broken into two parts. So the, the first part I'm going to uh, be discussing primarily shear connections and some of the requirements related to shear connections beyond just consider considerations of strength. And then in the second part, Pat McManus is going to be talking about um, some different ways to analyze and design built up PJP welds. Uh, bolt groups that involve uh, some shear with eccentricity and then also axial loads. And then he's going to have a discussion also on prying action um, and, and a way to sort of break out the different limit states that are involved in the checks that are shown in, in part nine of the manual relative to that. And so um, we'll kick things off first by uh, a discussion about differences between the manual and the, the specification. Uh, which sometimes aren't real clear. So everything we're going to talk about today is going to, to going to satisfy the, the, the AISC specifications, um, though some of what we're going to talk about today is not necessarily covered in the manual or is a different approach to things that are covered in the manual. And so we need to understand the difference between those two documents um, to do that. So if we're talking about the specification, one thing to note is typically the spec is adopted into law by reference in the building codes. And the, the same thing applies to the seismic provisions. So there's going to be a reference in the, in the, uh, in the IBC, for instance, to the AISC specification and the seismic provisions. Uh, but if we look at the manual, there is no reference to the manual in the building codes. And so that, that adoption into law has a, plays a part in how we actually author these documents. So the specifications written and intended to be used as a set of requirements related to the design of structural steel buildings and, and similar structures. And that's the way it's written. It's written that those are things that you, you have to do to comply with the building code. Uh, but when we look at the manual, we, we take a different approach to, to writing that. It's really intended to provide guidance as to how to satisfy the specification. So it's not written or intended to be used as a set of requirements. And because of that, trying to make those requirements in your contracts by using statements like the design shall conform to the AISC manual is really not consistent with our intent. And it can lead to a lot of confusion on the projects. Um, so with that out of the way, I'm going I'm to talk now about um, connection design, shear connections primarily, as I stated earlier. And we're really looking at the considerations for these connections beyond strength. So we all know we have to make sure the connection is strong enough to take the, the demand, the, the design loads. But beyond that, we, we have these other considerations. And these are just some. There's, there's probably more as well. So we have rotational ductility for simple connections that has to be considered, torsional restraint at the end of these beams, uh, compatibility, stiffness. And there, there's other requirements as well. But today we're going to concentrate on those first two, the rotational ductility and the torsional restraint. So if we look at the rotational ductility of, of simple connections, uh, first I want to explain what exactly we're talking about. So we're talking about a simple beam. And when you load a simple beam, uh, whether you're talking about a point load or you're talking about a uniform load, uh, the beam is going to deflect. And as that beam deflects, since the end connections are assumed to be pinned, the ends are going to rotate. I had a little lag there. Uh, 
Um, and so when these beams rotate, they're, they're going to rotate, and that ro the amount of rotation is going to be dependent on the load that's applied. However, when we put together design procedures for the manual or we, we configure tests for shear connections, there's so this de facto uh, target of 0.03 radians that we, we try to target. Uh, one thing that I'm going to point out in this talk later is that that's an extremely large rotation for a beam in service. So you're probably never actually going to see that 0.03 radians that we try to target. And that's going to give you a little bit more flexibility when you're actually looking at um, shear connections in practice. Now there is a, uh, there's actually a couple specification requirements related to this uh, rotational ductility. And the first one appears in section B3.6A. Of the, of the specification. And basically what it does is it defines what a, a shear connection is, and it's what we would think it is. It, it transmits negligible moment. But then towards the end of that, that section, it says a simple connection shall have sufficient rotation capacity to accommodate the required rotation determined by the analysis of the structure. So that's, that's the specification requirement. We have to be able to accommodate this simple beam end rotation and it's important to note here that we're not, we, don't, we aren't setting a rotation, that, uh, a fixed rotation like the 0.03 radians that we have to meet. Instead, we only have to meet the rotation that's determined from the analysis. Um, the second requirement in the specification related to this actually appears in specification section J1.2. And J1.2 um, sort of gives us similar requirements, but then also gives us some insight as to how we would actually satisfy this requirement. So it says flexible beam connections shall accommodate end rotations of simple beams, essentially what we said in B36A. But then it goes on to say some inelastic but self-limiting deformation of the connection is permitted to accommodate the end rotation of a simple beam. And that, so that gives us an indication that we're going to accommodate this rotation through some inelastic deformation. And that can be, we'll, we'll look at the ways that can happen, but you know, it can be flexing of angles or, or plowing or bearing deformations of, uh, at, at um, shear tabs, for instance. So some of the ways we, we do accom accom accommodate this rotation is for double angles, single angles, shear end plates, and T connections. We, we put limitations in Part 10 of the manual on the geometry and the thickness of the angles or plates or T's uh, such that flexing of those connecting elements out of plane, so weak axis flexing of those elements accommodates those, the rotation. And we could sort of quantify, well, there's also a requirement in the specification J2.2B, um, which is related to this, this uh, accommodation of rotation where we limit the returns on these welds, and that's to allow that weak axis flexure that I was, I was just talking about. And then in part nine of the manual, we sort of quantify some of these checks um, for rotational ductility. They're kind of hidden behind the scenes in part 10, but if you needed to check something explicitly, you could go to part nine. And so in this case, we're looking at a, a WT, but it could be a double angle. It could be an end plate as well that for some reason has been welded. And, and this sets the, a minimum size on the weld such that that um, end plate or T flange or, or double angle will flex before that weld fractures. And there's a similar check also in part nine of the manual for the bolts. So again, we're setting a minimum bolt diameter to ensure that that plate's going to flex um, without that, that angle, um, there, that plate's gonna, gonna flex, or the, the, the angles are gonna flex without the bolts actually fracturing. So we're, we're having ductile behavior to accommodate that simple beam end rotation. Now there are other types of connections, such as seated connections, uh, which could either be a, an unseated, unstiffened seat, like we show here, or a stiffened seat. And in, in this case, we, we also have a, a stability issue, torsional stability, so we, we put the top angle on. Now we want to keep that top angle thin because if we, if you can imagine, if we made that, that restraint very, very stout, very stiff, then we would have something approaching more like a moment connection or a partially restrained connection at least. And so we keep it thin to accommodate again that simple beam end rotation to make sure we can, we can get that, that rotation, free rotation at the end of the beam. Now there's other types of connections such as the single plate shear connections that are inherently stiff, and, and so they, they get a little bit more scrutiny and, and more explicit requirements really in the, in the, in the manual and their design procedures. Uh, but it's the same kind of idea that we want to accommodate this simple beam end rotation. And we do that typically by, by setting the geometry and the thickness of the plate 
so that the plate will yield so that the plate will yield and the bulk group will rotate um, and or we can allow elongation of the holes to accommodate that rotation which is essentially a uh, local bear bearing failure at those bolts horizontally to allow that rotation to occur. And these are the requirements that again are in part 10 of the manual related to these uh, extended and, and conventional shear tabs. So in terms of the conventional shear tab, we're limiting the thickness um, such that we, we ensure that that bolt plowing, that sort of localized bearing failure is going to occur uh, to accommodate the rotation. Um, and then we size the weld to this 5 eighths of the plate thickness. And that's done, again, to make sure that, that, that those bolts will plow or, in the case of the extended tab, the, the plate will, will yield locally uh, before that weld actually fractures. And then the final check is a thickness, maximum thickness check on the plate to ensure that the, the bolt group won't, flat, won't fracture or rupture before that plate yields to accommodate that rotation. Another requirement relative to connection rotation that's, that's sometimes overlooked is in the seismic provisions now in F2.6b. Uh, we have requirements either to develop some moment in these connections uh, due to the, the, the inelastic response of the structure. We're going to get very large um, drifts, 2.5% in that range, and that's going to cause this large rotation. And so to accommodate that, we have to, we have to uh, ensure these connections can take a rotation of 0.025 radians. And so in this case, unlike B36A, where we don't have a target rotation, that's constant. We, we actually do in the seismic provisions. Now one thing to, to recognize is, as I stated before, the connections that are in part 10 of the manual or those checks that I talked about earlier that are in part 9 of the manual uh, will ensure that your, your connection is capable of accommodating 0.03 radians. So it's nice by, because just by having a simple or standard shear connection or, or checking those checks in part 9, you can ensure you meet the 0.025 radians that's required in the, in the seismic provisions. Now, there's other ways. So those are, those are the kind of, I've covered the ways that simple shear connections um, accommodate rotation in the manual design procedures. Uh, but what, what can often happen, or what sometimes happens in practice, is you'll have connections that are either existing or because of, of some, someone's overlooked something, or there, there's been a problem in the field and the connections had to been, be, has been changed in some way. You no longer meet those, those parameters that are in Part 10 of the manual. And if you went back and you checked potentially the checks in Part 9 of the manual, you cannot satisfy those. And so then you have to start looking for other ways to accommodate the simple beam end rotation. And one of the ways that you can do that is if you're framing to the web of a, of a fairly flexible uh, girder or even a column, then you can probably assume that, that that web is going to be able to flex and accommodate a good bit of that simple beam end rotation. And so when people have problems, and, and sometimes in, 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 on a project you'll have widespread problems, um, related to this. And what I recommend is people look for the, sort of the low-hanging fruit first. And so if you had a lot of conditions that were spans roll beams or where you're going to the webs of columns and you don't have a backup, then you can eliminate all those from consideration potentially and then concentrate on what remains to, to see you know, where you might have to sharpen your pencil and, and make sure you're still okay. Another case that comes up frequently relative to this is where you have beams that are fairly short relative to the, to the depth. And when you have that kind of situation, you can expect you're going to have very little end rotation. Now, this is an odd condition where we actually had some very high blast requirements. So we have a, a very short beam. We have a, a beam that's about 24 inches long and about 24 inches deep. Uh, and this wouldn't be usual, but I wasn't worried about end rotation here. But the more common condition is more like something like a transfer girder where you've got a, a column sitting on a, a girder that's very deep and maybe the, the span is fairly short. And so you've got a very high shear demand, which is driving up your plate thickness, for instance, uh, but you have very little end rotation. So you may not be worried about meeting things like the, the 5 eighths of the plate thickness on the weld for a shear tab, uh, for instance. 
So I want to tie in a little bit this idea I talked about the, the, the demands in terms of rotation relative to the depth and relative to the span of these beams. And so I've, I've put a plot here where I'm looking at a, a W8, a W18, and a W36. And we're going to see what the, the rotation of each of these is relative to the span. And, and so you can see that in the graph. And, but to sort of put it into better terms here, um, we get about 0.03 radians when the span of the beam is equal to about 36 times its depth, or the span in feet is equal to about three times the depth in inches. Um, you get about 0.02 radians when that, that ratio is, is 24. So your span in feet is about twice your depth in inches. And I think it's commonly, that, that level is sort of commonly taken as w uh, an indication that the beam may be unserviceable past that point for deformation. So when you're, when you're at that point, you're, you're not at that 0.03 radians. You're only at about 2 thirds of that um, at this point. And then just to finish it off, um, you get about 0.01 radians when your span equals about 12 times your depth. So that kind of gives you an idea as to, to what kind of rotation and rotation you're actually going to expect for various types of beams. Now we can also look at this. We're not just concerned about the rotation. In some cases, we're, we're actually concerned about the, the translation of these, these uh, connections, uh, these elements. So in the case of a conventional shear tab, for instance, we assume that the rotation is taken up by the plowing of the bolts. So we have a, a localized yielding failure, um, at, particularly at those top and bottom bolts. And so the depth of the beam is going to play a part in that as well as the end rotation. So if we assume that we have rotation about the center of the connection, um, this plot is showing what the rotation, what the translation of those top and bottom bolts would be. So for a W8, we only get about an eighth inch of translation. So even if we just had short slotted holes, we could probably take up all of that rotation uh, without ever putting any real demand on the bolts. Whereas when we get to a 36 inch beam, uh, we probably have something in ex excess of uh, a half inch. So now, you know, at 0.03 radians, uh, so then we would have to get, you know, we would start putting some demand on those bolts in, a in order to accommodate that rotation. And this is actually reflected in the design procedures in Part 10 of the manual for the conventional shear tab, where we relax the, the plate thickness requirements when we have shallower uh, beams and short slots because that, that uh, rotation can be accommodated already in the short slots without any demand on those bolts. So again, you can run into situations where you, you, you can't meet the, the limitations of the tables in Part 10, and maybe you can't make those, those checks in Part 9 work for whatever reason on your connection. Uh, and when that happens, what you want to do is start looking at other sources of deformation to make these things work. Um, so some of the sources are connection flexural yielding. So that, that's kind of what we were talking about relative to these angles and these, um, the angles and the end plates and the, the WT type connections. You get the flexing of that out of plane um, element in the weak axis. You also get flexural yielding in the extended tab plates, but in that case it's strong axis. Then you have bearing deformations at the bolt holes and bearing deformations also at the beam webs. And so that's how we accommodate the, the end rotation typically on the uh, shear tabs, the conventional shear tabs. Um, and you know, and we, we make sure we have at least one mechanism for those connections in, in part 10 to accommodate this rotation. And if we have more than one mechanism, then so much the better. So some of those other mechanisms would be the rotation of the support that I talked about before, and then even things like bolt shear deformations or weld deformations. We typically don't think of the, the, the fasteners and the welds as being particularly ductile, but they, they do have some deformation capacity, capability, and so then they can accommodate some of this rotation. And to give you an idea of what kind of rotation you can expect to get out of this or what kind of deformation you expect to, to get out of some of these elements, if you look at part seven of the manual, we summarize some data relative to the instantaneous center of rotation method for bolts. And you'll see there we get about 3 eighths of an inch rotation, so I think a little bit less than that for a uh, 3 quarter inch A325 bolt. Now that's the total deformation in the connection. So that's the bearing deformation 
of the elements, and it's also the, the shear deformation in the bolt. But that, that deformation is about half the diameter of the bolt. So that's, that's quite a bit that you can accommodate just through those mechanisms alone for a standard connection. Um, and then short slots offer roughly, it depends on the, the diameter of the bolt, what the hole size is, there's a slot size, is, but it's about a quarter inch of movement. So that kind of gives you an idea of what you can accommodate uh, through those, those sorts of mechanisms. Another uh, question that often comes up is if you have a shear tab, for instance, like shown here, uh, sometimes what will happen is you get out into the field and for whatever reason the, the, the bolts won't make up. You can't get those holes to line up. And the common fix is then to go ahead and weld that shear tab uh, to the web of the beam as a, as a field fix. And then the question becomes, well, if I have this all welded connection, but part 10 of the manual and, and all the testing and everything assume that I had a, a bolted connection in there, is this going to be OK? And so typically what I've recommended to people in the past is that if you, if you have to weld, try to stop the welds, those horizontal welds, short of the holes. So it could either be the second column of bolts as I show here. You could maybe take it all the way into the first column of bolts. But the idea is sort of the longer you can make that, that free length of plate, the better off you're going to be. And then also by stopping it around where those bolt holes are, in, in my mind, you're, you're kind of re reducing the strength of that section, sort of like a dog bone connection that you'd have in a special moment frame. And by weakening that section, you're, you're going to let it hinge there and get that. Uh, you're going to be able to accommodate that simple beam end rotation the way, the way you intend. Uh, now we're in a little bit better shape relative to this potentially because there's been some research at McGill University that's cited here. Uh, and you, I think you can still download that research from, from McGill and you can have a look at that data yourself and, and see what you think of it and make your own judgments. And I believe that in their test they actually did stop the weld short of the holes as I show here. And it, it seemed like things behaved pretty well. Uh, so now we, so we have some answers actually to this question. Um, they're a little more um, solid answers that you can look at in terms of that, that research. So to sort of summarize relative to the rotational ductility, the um, thing you want to keep in mind, I think you want to keep in mind relative to this entire presentation is that the, the manual procedures are generally going to be uh, adequate for most of the conditions you're going to encounter. So if you can do what the manual is doing, if you can satisfy those design procedures, if you can satisfy those restrictions that are within the tables in Part 10, then that's, that's going to be your preference for the most part. Um, but when you, when you come into some odd condition, then you want to think about some of these other things. So one, the first thing to recognize is that we're shooting for that 0.03 radians when we test these connections or when we come up with these design procedures. But it's, it's going to be very, very rare. It's probably going to be unheard of that you're actually going to have 0.03 radians of end rotation on any, any serviceable beam in practice. And then the other thing to, another thing to recognize is that there are lots of sources of end rotation, uh, rotational capacity. Uh, that you can find in these connections. And so if you run into a problem, like I said earlier, kind of look for the low-hanging fruit, find the ones that you can eliminate from consideration right away, and then just concentrate on those that become a little trickier to prove out. And then um, another thing that's kind of nice from a design standpoint is that shear connections with the largest demands rarely have the greatest rotational demand. And what I'm, what I'm saying here is when you get into conditions like these transfer girders, you're going to have very, very high shears, uh, but they're, they're probably going to be pretty deep relative to their span. So you're not going to have a lot of end rotation. So even though you end up with a very thick plate, you may be able to relax, for instance, that 5 8 of the plate thickness requirement on the weld. Um, and then also where this comes into play is where you have something that's essentially configured like a shear connection, but in addition to the shear, you're taking some axial load. So something like a collector beam or a drag strut or, or whatever you want to call it, um, those beams are typically going to have to be a lot stouter because of that axial load, and therefore they're going to have less end rotation. So again, even if you can't meet those, those parameters in Part 10, uh, you may be able to relax it, and you can come up with rational models uh, to, to check those conditions if you get concerned about them. So now I'm going to move on from the rotational uh, ductility requirements over to uh, torsional restraint. And this is one of those situations where though we're talking about um, connection design in this, in this presentation, the specification requirement is actually sort of hidden in terms of a, a connection perspective because it's not in Chapter J. 
Uh, it's actually in um, Chapter F. So if you go into Section F1, you'll see that there's a, a number of assumptions that have to be satisfied in order to apply those uh, equations in Chapter F to determine the flexural strength of, of members. And one of those is that the, it states the provisions in this chapter are based on the assumption that points of support for beams and girders are restrained about rotation against rotation about their longitudinal axis. So the idea here is that at the, at the, wherever you have a support, we're assuming that that beam can't twist and you can't have basically a lateral torsional buckling failure right there at the support, that this beam is not going to just lay down. Um, if, you, if you do not have any restraint at the ends, then essentially, theoretically, that beam can just spin and you have no bending capacity on the beam. Um, to kind of give an idea as to what the concern is and what the effect is relative to this torsional restraint, I, I sort of tried to summarize uh, a lot of the data that's available out there relative to this. And so on the horizontal axis, I'm showing the ratio of the, the torsional stiffness of the connection relative to the torsional stiffness of the beam. And then on the vertical axis, I'm showing sort of the percentage of the capacity uh, flexural capacity that you would get based on those various ratios of the stiffness if you were to calculate the, the capacity using the equations, let's say, in chapter F. Um, so what, what you can see here is you never, you never quite get to 100% of your capacity, and, and you're never going to have a connection that's, a, that's, that's completely fixed um, relative to this, that completely restrains this uh, torsional uh, movement. And, and people draw the line in, in various places. So uh, you know, at a ratio of about 20 times the, the stiffness of the connection versus the beam, you can see there you're going to get about a 5% reduction. And some people consider that to be, be, to be satisfactory. Um, if you go down to about 10% of the ratio, you're more like a 10% reduction. And some people consider that to be, um, to be acceptable. Uh, and that's, that's sort of a judgment call, but this sort of puts uh, some, some quantitative numbers onto what the effect of this is. Uh, so we're going to see how we, we deal with this um, in, the, in the manual. Uh, but first, what I want to do is I want to make it clear um, that for the vast majority of the, the beams you're probably going to design in practice, this isn't going to be much of a consideration. Uh, there's, there's certain connections, though, that are worthy of, 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 of note uh, relative to this torsional restraint. So one of them is if you have long, deep copes at the end of a beam, especially a double cope, then essentially you've just got a plate hanging out there, and it, it may be relatively thin because beam webs are, are relatively thin, and that's not going to have a lot of torsional restraint. So you may be concerned about that. Um, beams that are supported on bearing plates, or, or the run over columns, for instance, that will be a consideration because uh, you have no restraint there at the top. And then extended single plate shear connections where you do not have a slab, where you're not otherwise braced at the, the points of support. And so one thing I want to make clear here is when you go into part 10 of the manual, there, there is a requirement that bracing be provided um, at the ends of these, at the ends of the beam itself. And so if you don't have bracing, then the Part 10 uh, design procedure really is not applicable. And you have to use your own engineering judgment to determine how to design these connections to make sure that, that you satisfy primarily those requirements in, in Section F. So in the manual, how we actually deal with this is, is a little bit hidden, maybe. but. Um, in part 10 of the manual, if you went into those tables and where we give you a beam depth and we give you uh, connection depth, you'll see that half we, we limit the connections such that the, uh, the, the shear connection is at least half the depth of the beam. And that's generally assumed to provide sufficient restraint against rotation so that you can apply those equations in Chapter F. And I've looked at that myself, um, sort of applying the, the principles that were I, got from that research I showed earlier, and, and, it, and it holds up pretty well. That If you have a half-depth connection, you, you pretty much can assume that you've got your sufficient torsional restraint. Also in the manual, I believe in part two of the manual, we, we deal with this idea of connections on bearing plates where we just have the beam bearing on something. And the manual states that we can provide stability through several means. Uh, so one way would be to actually build the beam 
into uh, solid concrete or masonry using some sort of anchorage devices. And, and obviously, that would restrain that beam from twisting and then be able to satisfy that, re that assumption that's inherent in Chapter F. We could put some sort of top flange connection with the floor roof system. So I'll point this out later as well, that as long as you have a diaphragm on there, that can be assumed to support that, that beam. So for instance, if the beam could be assumed to be fully laterally supported, your torsional restraint at the end is going to be less of a consideration. Uh, relative to this, this item in particular, um, you have to consider that while well, they have to erect this beam somehow, so during the actual construction process, that, that deck or that uh, floor system won't be there. And so you may have to make some considerations as to how they actually get this beam erected until that, that's all stabilized. And the third item here is the top flange stability connection. So that would be similar to the, um, the seated connection that we saw earlier where we put a, a stability angle on there. Um, at the top or near the top of that, that beam to keep the beam from laying over. And then finally, we could put an end plate or transverse stiffeners that are, you know, as they're shown here in this little sketch, um, located over the bearing plate and then extend those stiffeners up to near the top flange. Now one thing the manual doesn't specifically mention, uh, but that's also going to be important is somehow you have to tie that beam back down to the bearing plate, either with some sort of you know studs or bolts or or maybe a couple short welds. Um, because again, if even if you put a stiffener on there, you could potentially have that beam sort of way over. You may not have enough strength and stiffness there to to support those uh, assumptions that are made in chapter F. One uh, area of particular note or con particular concern that, again, is addressed in the manual is when beams run continuous over columns. And in this case, you, you potentially could violate two different um, assumptions that, that you're making in your design. So first, relative to the beam itself, you may not have the torsional restraint at the, at the support. Um, because that column can move freely unless there's some kind of stabilizer plates or something provided as are shown in the sketch. Um, so you wouldn't be able to su support the, the, the use of chapter F flexural uh, bending equations. And then relative to the column, you probably assume that the column is pin-pinned and, and doesn't experience side sway, um, which also might not be the, an adequate assumption. So you'd end up with something more like a, a flagpole type of situation or a partially restrained flagpole, which would be even worse. Um, and so we, we put the stabilizer plates in there as we're showing in this sketch to address those kind of situations. So I mentioned earlier that you could put a stability angle in. Um, and so that's what's shown here. It's, this is one of those things that's kind of interesting because we, we sort of, as we often have in, in engineering, uh, competing goals. So relative to the rotational capacity, the, the allowing this beam to be a simple beam, we want to make sure that that angle is kept thin um, and, and so that we don't develop a, a lot of restraint at the top. And we talked about that earlier. But then relative to the torsional restraint, we want to make sure that there's enough restraint there that the beam doesn't lay over so that we can use those equations in chapter F. And this, the, the angle works out nicely in this respect because we're bending about the weak axis relative to the end rotation, uh, but we're trying to move it relative to the strong axis relative to this torsional restraint. So the, the angle is inherently strong where we need it to be strong, and it's inherently weak uh, where, we, where we want it to be weak. So it kind of works out nicely. Then I mentioned this earlier, but I'll, I'll mention it again because it's important. This is what gets us out of having to consider this torsional restraint, you know, explicitly in a lot of our design. But if we, if we have a fully braced beam or we have a beam that's, you know, highly braced, um, then this torsional end restraint is going to have a lot, or the lack of torsional end restraint is going to have a lot less effect on the, the capacity of this beam. So we've probably satisfied. Uh, the, the assumptions that are inherent in Chapter F just by having the beam fully braced. And a lot of the beams that we're going to encounter in design are actually going to be fully braced in buildings. So in summary, um, we've got half-def connections uh, that are specified in Part 10 of the manual. And they're going to provide torsional end restraint that we need to justify our designs for our beams. And typically, in the, va you know, in the vast majority of cases, you just provide a half-depth connection and, and you're fine. Um, 
we want to recognize that significantly braced beams are less dependent on the end restraint. And again, that's going to eliminate this concern for a lot of, a lot of our actual designs in practice. Um, long double coat beams typically provide less restraint than extended tab plates. And I bring this up in particular because when we introduced the uh, design procedures for the ex extended single plate shear connections, uh, there, there were a lot of concerns among some people that you know, we may not be providing enough torsional restraint. Um, but in my experience, especially on a lot of industrial projects where, where you may not have a fully braced beam, um, it, wasn't, it was not uncommon to end up with fairly long double copes. And then they would put a very torsionally stiff end connection, like a double angle connection in there, um, somehow thinking that that's going to provide enough torsional restraint. But it's actually the, the cope section that's going to govern, and that's going to be very weak. And when you apply the design procedures in part 10 of the manual to these extended tab plates, you're typically going to get a plate that's much thicker than the web that it's connecting. So it's going to have a lot more torsional restraint than that double um, coped beam. So the, the extended tab plate is, is probably going to be a better detail than a long double cope with a, with a, a torsionally stiff connection like a double angle at the end. Um, so if there, if there weren't concerns about all those double copes for all those years, then there really shouldn't be uh, that much more concern about these extended tab plates. And then finally, this is hard to quantify, uh, but it's something to, to take into account because it, it, it sort of means that if we make a design assumption, then we're probably on the conservative side. And, it's, and, and what I'm getting at here is that it's difficult to apply a load without provi providing some restraint as well. So the worst case condition relative to this torsional end restraint would be if you had a bare beam and you bring a column down right in the middle of it. Now if that column were, were truly pinned, then it's providing no restraint. And so all of the restraint necessary is going to come from those end connections. Uh, but when you actually connect the column down to a beam, you're typically going to have a base plate. You're going to have probably at least four bolts in that base plate. And so it's going to look somewhat like, like a moment connection. It's not going to be a fully fixed connection, but it's going to have some, some restraint torsionally to that beam. And um, it's, it's hard to quantify that. We're typically not going to account for it in our design. But it is kind of nice to know that whatever we have done to, to ensure we have torsional, torsional restraint, we probably have a little bit more helping us along the way as well. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Pat McManus to, to talk about built-up PJP welds, uh, the bulk group analysis, and prying action. Great. Actually, before that, I just want to uh, oh, thank you, Larry. I just want to remind everyone that you may submit questions for Larry and Patrick through the chat at any time. Um, go ahead, Patrick. All right. Thank you. Uh, so yes, I'm going to tag on to what Larry has presented and talk to, about some things that, uh, with regard to welds, aren't directly addressed um, by the spec or the manual uh, with regard to built-up PJPs. And then regarding bolt group analysis, talk about uh, things that the manual does address, but perhaps some alternate methods to what's in the manual. Uh, and, and the same is true of prying action. So talking about built up PJP welds, <clears throat> um, to start, I think it's, it's best to define or explain what that is. So some of our typical weld types on the left here, we have a complete joint penetration weld. Um, which, of course, is where we're trying to fuse through the entire thickness without any, any inclusions uh, of the material that we're connecting. And so to do that, we typically have to have a, a backer rod, or we end up coming back in after the fact and uh, back gouging and re-welding on that opposite side. And of course, the welds can be a, a double bevel or single bevel, like what's shown here. Uh, but that's how we fuse clear through. So we're getting an effective throat that is essentially equal to the thickness of the material. Um, a, a PJP weld, uh, we aren't fusing through the full thickness of the material. We're getting an effective throat that, that is less than the actual thickness of the material. And so we don't uh, necessarily have to back gouge or have any backing on the opposite side to achieve that. And these can be of, of variable size in relation uh, to the thickness of that material. So then if we move to a built-up PJP, um, what, what we're talking about is uh, essentially a, a, a PJP weld that then has a reinforcing fillet. 
like what is shown here. And we'll talk about why, why you would do that. So in, in speaking about each of those weld types, uh, the CJP welds, uh, some of the advantages to those are, are that we have a, a high capacity weld, right? We have, we have high available stress uh, that inherently develops the base material because we've gone through the thickness. So this in many ways is, is, is the crutch uh, in some cases for the design community. These can be abused pretty readily uh, because the, the, the approach is often taken where you just design your member, you provide a PJP that develops the base material and so you're done. Um, the issue is that CJP welds are expensive. The disadvantages are that you have to use the backer bars or back gouging like we talked about uh, uh, one slide prior. And often cases you, you are required to have weld access holes so that you get complete fusion across the connected element. And then to take advantage of that um, high, high nominal stress to develop the base material, uh, you essentially have a lower factor of safety so you have more enhanced inspection requirements. Uh, so chapter N of the AISC spec will require ultrasonic testing of some sort on CJP wells and the, the frequency of that depends on risk category now. Built up PJPs some of the advantages are that you don't have UT requirements. Uh, chapter N doesn't require UT on either partial joint penetration wells or fillet wells. Um, there are no weld access holes. Um, well, that, that's not always the case. In most cases, you don't necessarily need a weld access hole. There may be conditions where, where you are trying to make sure you get clear across the member or you have a reinforcing weld on the opposite side and uh, then then you may need one, but in general, uh, if you're on one side of the material, there's no need for the weld access holes, and uh, there's no need for backing bars or back gouging uh, like we discussed previously with PJP welds. The disadvantage is that you have a lower available stress. There's a, there's a larger factor of safety involved. Uh, so you potentially have more weld material to achieve the same capacity. Uh, so that's the trade-off, is that if you have a lower factor of safety, then you have enhanced QA, QC requirements in the form of ultrasonic testing. If you have a higher factor of safety, then, then you don't have quite the need for the QA, QC. So this can be a less expensive weld in some cases. So talking a little bit what we're trying to achieve when we provide that reinforcing fillet and, and the advantage of that. Um, when we design a typical PJP weld, our effective throat is usually what's shown by this red dashed line here. Uh, it, it's, it's the fusion surface to, to the cross material or the T material there. That is our effective throat. The effective throat or the intent of the effective throat in the spec being essentially the shortest distance through the weld material. That's going to give us the highest stress and so that's, that's the governing location if you will. When you provide that reinforcing fillet, essentially you're increasing the length of that effective throat like we have shown on this red line. So this particular case, we've got a fillet weld that's actually larger than the PJP weld. This may be common if these are both single pass welds um, and you're dealing with relatively thin material. Because what you will see is that uh, if you start to get a, a fillet weld that is substantially larger than the PJP weld, you're not getting a heck of a lot of bang for your buck um, for increasing that fillet weld size beyond the size of the PJP. That length isn't increasing very much. Uh, w when you first lay it down, if the fillet weld is the same size as the PJP, then you get roughly a, a, a square root of two or 40% increase in that effective throat. So this is more the condition when you have thinner material. Probably the more common condition uh, would be where you maximize the size of the PJP weld in relatively thick material and provide a reinforcing fillet weld that's actually smaller than the PJP weld. So in this case, again, we'll go back to if we just lay down a PJP weld alone, this will be our effective throat. And when we lay in that reinforcing fillet, we've now increased our effective throat uh, to essentially the hypotenuse of the PJP weld size 
and the fillet weld size. And so that gives us increased strength over just the PJP alone. One question that comes up when we're talking about these is how do I, do I receive a directionality increase for loading transverse to the weld uh, rather than shear parallel to it? And so this is a discussion I had with Dwayne Miller. Uh, and so when, when Dwayne tells, tells me something about a weld, uh, we usually listen. So, or, or hopefully we always listen. Dwayne's about as knowledgeable as it gets on that topic. So let's talk about directionality increase in fillets to begin with. So if I have a load that is in and out of the plane of the page, so I'm placing that effective throat in shear, um, that, that is where we don't have a directionality increase. That is just the, the available stress that you get um, right out of, of the tables uh, in table J2.5 of the spec. And so then if I change that into a tension load upward, so I have a transverse load on the fillet, that effective throat that I was looking at in shear initially is now seeing combined shear and tension. And, and because it's, it's as much in tension, I guess, as it has in shear, we have a little higher available stress, so we get a strength increase. And so really, if we look at all the sections throughout this weld, this section here at the base is theoretically almost entirely in tension whereas this section over here at the edge is almost entirely in shear. And again, if I, I just look at the length increase here, you would suggest that I get about a 40% increase. The spec allows us about a 50% increase because uh, the ones they've tested, they, they have found that, that we can count on that reliably. So we get that 50% directionality increase for loading the weld in this direction. So that, that's the case on fillet welds. Now, what we have found is that when we test those to failure, this is the actual failure plane that occurs with the loading in this direction. And that's generally because the material is, is uh, smarter than we are. And so it's, it's inherently looking at where its maximum stress state occurs. So like we mentioned, there, there is combined shear and tension throughout uh, different sections uh, that you're looking at in this weld and ultimately it's going to find the one that produces the, the combination of length of effective throat and uh, shear and tension interaction that creates the, the greatest von Mises stress or the greatest stress state, and that's where it chooses to fail. Well, I'm speaking with Dwayne. Uh, we agreed that this is, is starting to approach the failure plane that you're inherently achieving by creating a built-up PJP, uh, so a directionality increase is, is probably not warranted. For what it's worth, uh, you do get a small directionality increase on just PJPs alone, uh, but it's very small, and, and it's in part for this very reason. That effective throat is already uh, more or less in, in tension, and there's some issues with, with uh, inclusion of a crack down at the base. So your feed factor in LRFD design just goes from 0.75 uh, up to 0.8, so you only get about a 6% increase, whereas the fillets we get a 50% increase. So, so the short answer is no, or, or very small, or in line with PJP directionality increase. So to finish out this topic, we'll talk about how exactly we do go about designing these. Um, first off, how we call out a PJP weld, or a built-up PJP weld, is shown here on the left. So the partial joint penetration weld size um, we show and provide an effective throat for that. And then outside of that, you show the reinforcing fillet that you would like. And then in this case, we're providing a fillet on the opposite side. So for detailing practice, this is exactly what you want to do. This fillet on the opposite side is important. It's, it's not required. Um, there's nothing that says you, you have to have it there. Uh, but it is good practice. If we don't do that, you can see that for certain configurations, you know, it's not as bad as a single-sided fillet, but it's still not great. If you don't have this reinforcing fillet and all the welding is simply on the left side or one-sided, you do start to uh, eccentrically load that weld, and, and that could get fairly severe. Um, what this reinforcing fillet does is, is it essentially makes this pseudo-crack in the PJP internal. 
that's very similar to in complete joint penetration wells where we normally have a backer bar in this case. We, uh, that backing may remain in most cases other than fatigue or high seismic if you weld that backer bar to this transverse piece. And that's because the, the pseudo crack that's created by the backer bar is now included or kept internal um, rather than a, a true surface crack by that reinforcing weld. We're doing the same thing here. We provide this reinforcing fillet on the back side. It makes this crack internal. It has less effect on, on initiating a crack across the weld, and it's, it's far more effective. Um, so from there, what we would then do is we would find that least effective throat, uh, just like we, we illustrated earlier, and provide the, the available stresses from table J2.5 uh, to design that particular weld on that side using that effective throat. And then the fillet on the opposite side is designed using the standard fillet weld um, provisions from the spec, in which case if you are loaded vertically in tension, you would get the full directionality increase on that fillet weld alone. For this side, you would just get the directionality increase associated with the PJP weld which is, again, taking your fee factor from 0.75 uh, up to 0.8. So let me talk real quick about um, why, what, what we have done actually in our office with, with these built-up PJP wells. We, we have essentially provided them, because we do a lot of connection design work and a lot of work for fabricators, uh, as an alternate to CJPs, uh, really for the fabricator to decide if it makes sense for him to use these and, and it's less expensive than providing a CJP. So what we've created is a table where for various thicknesses of material, um, we have provided combinations of either double-sided fillets or a single-sided built-up PJP with a reinforcing fillet that, that achieves or matches the allowable strength of the material. One thing to be clear here, this is not seismic design. We are not developing the expected strength of the material. All that's being done here is that the weld strength, um, the available strength of the weld is matching the available strength of the material. Whether you're looking in shear, then the weld will be considered in shear, and the material will be considered in shear, or in tension, the weld's considered in tension or transverse loading and the materials considered in tension. And you'll see that this, this actually matches up fairly close to some of the provisions you see throughout the manual, particularly for single plates, where you use 5 eighths of the uh, thickness of the material. If you have a fillet weld, double-sided fillet sized at 5 eighths the thickness of the material, that develops the material. If you run the equation through, you'll find that you, you actually need a slightly larger weld to match the available strength of the material in that case, but in that case, they've tested enough of them for single place that it's close enough. Um, this table just follows through that, that uh, methodology fully. Um, and, and I saw a question come up if we're talking about A36 or grade 50. This is assuming grade 50 plate, um, and for what it's worth, the single plate provisions do the same thing that 5 eighths thickness of the plate applies to both A36 and A572 grade 50. Um, so in this case, we've got double-sided fillets that, that, that match the capacity of the material um, up to a thickness of about an inch. And then we switch to maximizing a PJP side and then um, providing a, a reinforcing fillet uh, on each side to develop that material. And then we give them the out that uh, they can always still use the CJP if they would like. This is more for their convenience. All right, changing topics a little bit, I'm going to talk about bulk group analysis. Um, this is one of my favorite, favorite quotes from Einstein. Everything should be ma made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And I'm a big fan of trying to make things very simple, but this reminds us that there is a threshold of how simple you can make things. Some things are just complicated. And for me, uh, bulk group analysis uh, definitely falls into that category.
So to talk a little bit about what's currently in the manual, in Part 7 for bulk group analysis, um, AISC present, presents two methods. Uh, the, the primary method that's been embraced is the instantaneous center of rotation method, and then the other method is the elastic method. Advantages and disadvantages of each. So the instantaneous center of rotation method is the method that we found to be most accurate or, or correlate most closely to test results, and so it's, it's widely utilized and tabularized throughout the AISC manual. So it's, it's fairly readily available to use. The disadvantages of that method are that it, is, um, it requires iteration to determine where the instantaneous center of rotation is. Uh, you can't just solve it uh, using a, a simple equation or algebra, and therefore it can't be hard-coded. Uh, and the other disadvantage, because of that, it's difficult to check unless you have a configuration that's very close to something in the manual so you can get an order of magnitude, um, it, it's difficult, difficult to achieve this. And uh, I apologize, I was reading a couple of questions in there that I, I think I'll go back to because they relate back to the welds. Um, we'll, we'll stick to this topic for the time being. Um, moving on to the elastic method, now, the advantages of the elastic method are that it can be coded. Um, it uses basic principles of mechanics and materials, so it's understandable. The disadvantages are that that's, that's been found to be more conservative than the instantaneous center of rotation method and, and obviously test results. And really, if you use the methodology presented in the manual, I mean, all the terms that you do need to solve for and find, uh, it's not exactly straightforward. So I'm going to talk about a couple other methods that, that are, are alternate methods, and really what we're, we're falling under or the reason that these approaches are valid is really we're, we're hanging on to the lower bound theorem. Any of you who saw Larry's uh, T.R. Higgins lecture saw a lot of great points illustrating the lower bound theorem. And so essentially if we pick a method or assume a force distribution uh, where we satisfy statics and we design for all the limit states associated with that force distribution, uh, and we have ductility, the lower bound method says that, that our capacity will be less than um, the, the true capacity of the connection. And the better assumptions or the better we approximate through our force distribution, the actual force distribution through the element, the, the less conservative or more closely we get uh, to to that actual capacity. So that allows us a lot of freedom outside of the methods that are just presented in the manual to evaluate our bulk groups. So the first method I'm going to talk about is, is really specifically for drag connections or collector connections where we've got shear in a beam and axial load in a beam, um, which many of you who have done those connections, I'm sure you fight with how difficult it is um, to to tabularize those things. You know, you, you end up chasing down A shear and then looking at your axial and see if it works, and then uh, invariably you have some condition on another part of the job where, where that's a, a bit of a problem. Um, I, I did have a question come up asking if, if this is the KISS method. Uh, no, this will be a little different, and I'm going to illustrate it a little more here. So again, this is, this is specifically for um, collector connections is where I think it's, it's most applicable. Uh, it is dependent in part on the IC method. That's one of the, the downsides. So it's not something you can necessarily readily hard code. And it is a little more conservative than the IC method. So the method that we're talking about is, is fairly simple, and many of you have done connection design and probably used it. We're essentially saying that we're going to use a portion or one section of the bolt group to carry the vertical shear and another section to carry the axial load. And so all we're doing is we're saying that the shear occurs and so we're going to design this bolt group to carry the shear at an eccentricity E using the instantaneous center of rotation method because this is something we know is, is a condition that's probably tabularized and AISC gives us. And then the remaining columns of bolts here are going to carry the axial load. So if, if I carry those forces through or I come up with a resultant from that shear and axial, 
um, I, I can compare this to the instantaneous center of rotation method by recognizing I get a resultant force P that occurs at an angle theta, and that's at the face of the member, so we have an eccentricity to the center of the bolt group of E. Um, so that's, that's essentially what, um, how we're comparing this to the instantaneous center of rotation method so that we can, we can see where our results are, are landing compared to that method. Now, we went through and did the same thing for extended plate connections. So in this case, what we have is like we do for most extended place connections to, to get a reasonable shear capacity, we're now utilizing two vertical columns of bolts to carry the shear at this eccentricity E and then the remaining columns of bolts are carrying the axial. And again, if I come up with a resultant force at an angle and a larger eccentricity, I can compare this directly to uh, the IC method. And so here is that comparison. So what we've got are the dots in blue um, are, are the results from the instantaneous center of rotation method. The dots in red are from uh, the, the separation method that was just described. So on the horizontal axis here, what you're seeing is the number of horizontal rows of bolts. And so you can equate this to this may be a W8 where we can only get two horizontal rows in. This may be a W40 where we can get as many as 12 uh, horizontal rows in. And then the groupings that you see along the angles, this one here means that in addition to my bolts that are carrying shear, I have one vertical column of bolts carrying axial up to two, three, four, five vertical columns of bolts is what this group would be carrying axial. So we're really hitting most of the tables that are, that are present in the AISC manual. And so this, this data here is, is strictly for a single column of bolts assumed to carry the shear at an eccentricity of three inches. So, for example, we're connected to a column flange. And so what we see is that the difference um, of the separation approach from the IC method is an average of, of about 9% and maxes out at about 20, 21%. So it is more conservative, as you're seeing here, than the IC method. Uh, which is good, so, so we can count on it and falls right in line with the lower bound theorem. Um, so you do have that conservatism, but the beauty is it allows you to, to tabularize a shear that you can always count on and then just add vertical columns of bolts to get to the axial capacity that you're after. And so we did the same thing for a double column of bolts at an eccentricity of 12 inches so this would work as an extended plate connection going into the web of most of your W14 columns. Um, and so we have the same results going in there. And what you see is that uh, with the larger eccentricity and, and uh, more vertical columns, the errors open up a little bit, but they're still pretty reasonable. We got an average uh, difference. It's not really an error. It's a difference from the IC method of 17% and a max of about 30%, which you can see really occurs more when, uh, when you're just getting a heck of a lot of bolts. All right. So the next method I'm going to present, uh, we'll, we'll call it the interaction approach. And, and one thing to make clear, I'm not promoting any of these methods over what's already in the manual. Uh, there's simply more tools to add to your tool bag. And the intent is that that uh, like for that last method, the separation method, it's just a, a potentially a useful tool to be able to tabularize your shear and axial capacities for drag connections. This next method is more of a general method. Um, and one of the advantages are that it, it can be coded. Um, it's not iterative. It's fairly intuitive, I think, to me, and I think you'll see. It, it's more accurate than the elastic method. Uh, but it's, it's less accurate than the IC method, so it's, it's a little more conservative than the IC method uh, compared to the test results. So the interaction approach, um, and part of the reason that it gives a little better approximation than the elastic method is we're using components of the instantaneous center of rotation method. So um, if, if you go into uh, part seven of the manual, you'll see that they calculate the rotational capacity of a bolt group as C prime. 
And they do that using the instantaneous center of rotation method. And while this looks a little nasty as far as an equation goes, um, it's really not that bad. And the reason that it can be coded uh, or found directly using the instantaneous center of rotation method is that when we're looking at just rotational capacity, the instantaneous center of rotation is known. It doesn't have to be found or iterated to find. It's at the center of the bolt group. Um, that could get fussy if you have really uh, uh, non-symmetric bolt groups, perhaps, but it, that's, that's generally not the case. So all we've got in this equation is L sub i is the distance from that center of the bolt group to any of the, of the bolts in, in the member or each individual bolt in the bolt group. And then L max is the distance from the center to the bolt that is furthest away from the center of the bolt group. Delta max is 0.34 inches. Um, that's right in part seven. And, and that relates to what Larry was talking about earlier, that approximately 3 eighths of an inch, that is the, the maximum deformation that the bolt can take before it fails. Um, so that's the bolt that's at that deformation and that is seeing the greatest load. So all of these you can code into a spreadsheet relatively easily and find all these parameters for, for really any number of rows or columns of bolts. So then our, our traditional interaction approach is, is we just have load over capacity, uh, or uh, this could be shear or axial over capacity, plus moment over capacity has to be less than one, right? So if we extrapolate that to the bolt group, um, our load is, is the load P in shear. Our capacity to resist that is just the available strength of an individual fastener times the number of fasteners. Then our moment is that load times the eccentricity E and our rotational capacity to resist that is the, again, capacity of an individual fastener times the essentially rotational capacity or effective bolts resisting um, the rotation to give us a moment capacity of that bolt through. And so if I do a little uh, finessing, I can reconfigure that equation into the form you see here and develop an effective number of bolts or C value just like what's tabularized in the manual um, using the instantaneous center of rotation method. But it could be hard coded to determine this. The 1.11 factor we have here, this is, this is the same as 1 over 0.9. Um, and, and you'll see that show up uh, throughout the manual. It's particularly in uh, the, the single plate section of part 10 of the manual. Um, when they derive or, or try to uh, develop the rotational uh, ductility of a plate using the C prime value. In other words, uh, they use it when they verify that the bolt group in rotation is stronger than the bending capacity of the plate. And they implement this factor because um, th there should be no reduction in that particular case uh, for a non-uniform distribution of load through the bolt group uh, due to bolts loaded um, or edge bolts receiving much higher load. So they, they've reduced that out, and I guess that's when you, when you load something in a very long line of bolts, we recognize that some of the bolts near the end are going to be much more high or receive higher load. It's a non-uniform distribution of load through all the other bolts. So there's an inherent adjustment of 0.9 in there, and they take that out when they're looking at that. Uh, in the particular case we did, we're taking advantage of that. Um, probably not appropriate, really, except that rather large eccentricities where rotation is governing. So we're still looking at this approach a little bit and, and calibrating it uh, to, to the correct approach for the IC method, but there's merit in that this should probably be applied to only the rotational method. Um, in any event, if you pulled this out, um, you'll, you'll see that the results still still are pretty good, and this is something you could implement very easily by just calling this one. And so here, here's a look at those results. So what we have here is the red line are the results uh, associated with the instantaneous center of rotation method. The blue line is the interaction method we've just presented. The green line is the elastic method. 
And so what we have here is there's nothing on the horizontal axis because there are a whole lot of parameters that play into this. What is included in here are capacities or the effective number of volts um, at uh, various combinations from, from two horizontal rows up to five horizontal rows, and we're still expanding that out. Um, one vertical row up to, uh, I believe, four vertical rows, varying spacing in each direction associated with those rows, uh, differing load angles, and differing um, eccentricities. So really traveling through all of the, the tables that are in part seven for the IC method and trying to get a good spectrum of comparison across those. Um, don't be fooled that the IC method line is smooth. That's simply because we have sorted by that line. If I sorted by either of the others, then the IC method line would be jumping up and down. Um, so that's not necessarily a reflection that it's that much more accurate or stable. Um, what you will see, though, is that the uh, interaction method does correlate, or, or the peaks and valleys correspond very closely to the elastic method because they are inherently similar. Where you get a little more capacity out of the interaction method is primarily because when we're looking at the uh, uh, rotational or moment capacity of the bolt group, we're taking into account that nonlinear behavior um, that, that was really utilized in developing the IC method. So we get a little bit of uh, inelastic capacity benefit um, that gets us here. And really, I think it's actually a little easier to code than the elastic method. So what you can see is that um, compared to the interaction approach and the elastic approach compared to the IC method, the uh, elastic analysis can give you uh, fairly large errors, an average of close to 20% and a max uh, uh, difference, sorry, not error, of close to 40%. And, and we nearly cut those in half with the interaction approach. Um, like I said, we're still doing a little more work on this, um, and, and the intent is that it will be published and made available to you. But again, it goes back to the, the lower bound theorem and the approach that you can find a rational method of analysis, rational force distribution through your bulk group. Um, and as long as you design for all the, as long as you satisfy statics, designed for all the limit states associated with that, uh, there is certainly nothing wrong with that. You're, you're not just limited to the bulk group analyses that are presented in the manual. Change gears one more time to talk about prying action. Um, so prying action uh, is an interesting animal. Um, I've done a fair bit of work on this. I did some of my uh, PhD research on, on seismic uh, design of of T stubs. So we were intentionally, and that's what one of the pictures from is here, we were intentionally uh, trying to develop the prying mechanism or at least develop bending in the flange and making sure that that was our limit state as opposed to any of uh, the bolt failures. So prying action in the AISC spec um, is, is only addressed by the statement here, which is in section J.6. And, and it simply states that when you're considering the tension applied to the bolt, you need to consider prying action. But it does not dictate the method that you use to uh, consider prying action. And so one thing to be aware of is that there are a lot of methods out there. Um, Jim Swanson with the University of, of Cincinnati produced a great article in 2002 that summarized several of the methods for addressing prying action or, or determining the forces um, associated with prying behavior. And some of those included the Euro code. Um, most of what is in the manual currently is based on work done by Bill Thornton. And then it was really Jim Swanson's study uh, that that created the increase or, or gave us a little more capacity in utilizing rupture uh, strength of the material as opposed to yield strength of the material. But if you ever want to see a lot of the other methods, this is a great resource to do that. What's difficult, and part of the reason I tackled this topic, is I get a number of questions from our young engineers 
on the prying action equations that are currently in the AISC manual. Um, they just have difficulty following through the methodology, I guess, to some degree about what's in there. And so one of the things to, that, that gives them trouble, and gave me trouble for many years, still does, is that the methodology currently in the manual appears that there is just one limit state. Right? You, you have a lot of factors and, and uh, equations and terms that you solve for, but they ultimately get into one equation that has both bulk capacity and um, it appears bending capacity of the flange addressed at the same time, and it appears to be one limit state. And the reality is it's actually three limit states. And Swanson's article um, shows this very clearly. There are three limit states, and they're differentiated, or which limit state actually governs, depends on the term alpha. In other words, alpha is going to come up, and it's going to tell you that it's actually a real value, or it's zero, or it's one, and that's really telling you which limit state applies. And that's not always uh, obvious. So the limit states are presented here, and this is straight out of Swanson's article. So you have typical flange hinging, where we're looking at the plastic capacity of the flange in bending. And, and there is still a factor that addresses how much moment is going near the stem and how much moment is occurring near the bolts, but, but that's, that's one item. There's the combined mode, which means that we're having to look at both flange uh, hinging or flange bending, and we're also looking at the capacity of the bolts because um, we're getting a prying force to apply to those. And that is where most of the work, that, that is really the complicated um, limit state, and where most of the work uh, has taken place is really when you're in that realm. And then the other one is that, that you have a very stiff or a stiff and strong flange uh, that can develop the tension capacity of the bolts without applying any prying, and then you just have bolt tension. So all three of these limit states are really addressed. Um, in the approach in the AISC manual. It just isn't presented as three separate limit states. But one approach you could take is to actually just apply these three limit states directly, and then the, the lowest or governing capacity is the one that you would use. And, and again, the alpha term is inherently doing that in the approach in the manual. One thing to be aware of, again, um, the, the method in the manual really focuses on, on um, the, the combined mode and some ratios of um, gauge on the bolts that you see here to flange thickness uh, that, that really dictate or, or drive at that combined mode. So the method that's currently in the manual assumes that the distance between the hinges is the value of D prime where that is taken as, as the distance from the face of the stem to the edge of the bolt. And those are assumed to be the hinge locations. That's the method that's currently in the manual. Several of the other methods that are out there, some I've looked at in my research, um, as, as well as uh, methods that are, that are longstanding that Swanson produces uh, or presents in his article, including the Euro method, um, take into account this fillet and the fact that the hinging actually occurs down towards the toe of this fillet, which will give you some increased bending capacity if you're in that particular realm. And this illustrates exactly that point. Uh, again, this was one of the tests I ran, and you can see that the hinge clearly formed at this location. Um, you, can, you can see a clear change in curvature at that location as opposed to at the T-stem. And this one is about right on. It does occur about at the, the edge of the bolt. So again, the, the, the data that was used primarily um, to develop the uh, approach that is currently in the AISC manual used gauge to flange thickness ratios of less than six and flange thicknesses of greater than three quarters of an inch. Um, what I've found is doing a lot of connection design, particularly on industrial projects that almost always have axial load in members, is that we had a lot of end plate connections, maybe to the web only of beams, where you're using 3 eighths or half inch plate, 
and, and you're using a gauge of five and a half, maybe even seven inches, because those are standard gauges. So you were well outside of this range regularly. And so what you find is that you, you're truly in that flange bending limit state in that case. And the, you can get greater capacities using some of the other methods Swanson presents um, when you're in these ranges. And, and the work I did on, on my PhD work um, was really looking at gauge to flange thickness ratios of greater than 10, so quite a disparity from the six that you have here. To quickly show you one of the results from those, so this has a gauge to flange thickness ratio of 13, and what you find is that this red line here is the current, uh, what, what's currently in the AISC manual. Um, the prediction of the capacity is really a prediction of first yield. Uh, even though it's intended to be inelastic, you're getting first yield. Some of the other methods that Swanson uh, presents can uh, give you up to 20 or 30 percent increases over that. And so if you have some of those conditions, it just warrants maybe looking at one of those other methods. So to wrap up, um, a lot of what Larry and I have talked about is there are a lot of things that aren't directly addressed in either the spec or the manual. It doesn't mean that methods that fall out of the manual are prohibited. In fact, sometimes they're necessary given some of the conditions that you have in place. Um, <clears throat> now, when you're using alternate methods, uh, they should be scrutinized, particularly when you're using articles in general. They're always a little biased towards the author. Um, like Larry mentioned, one of the advantages of the manual is that you've had a lot of very smart people um, vet all of the data and articles and, and decide what should be in there. And then uh, the last thing when you're using alternate methods is, is that it's going to resort to engineering judgment uh, on, on what is appropriate for your project and, and if, if something outside of the manual or design guide is warranted. And with that, we'll turn it over to questions. Great. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, this first question is for Patrick. Uh, back on slides. Uh, 59 through 61. I'll take us back there. Uh, we have a question that the welds look like fillet welds. And so could you kind of clarify which welds belong to the PJP and why are I, they I called PJP? Um, you bet. So, and I, I apologize. You're absolutely right. The discussion topic was built up PJPs. This is clearly a fillet weld. And that was just for the discussion on whether or not a directionality increase was warranted. So my intent was just to clarify how, why we get the directionality increase that we do on fillet welds, why we don't get as much of an increase on PJPs, and, and to discuss that really the directionality increase associated with PJPs is what we should be using for built-up PJPs. So yeah, I apologize. This was a misleading title. Okay, great. Uh, Next question is uh, regarding slide 66. Can the fillet weld be larger than the plate thickness? Uh, it absolutely can. In fact, there's, there's nothing to prohibit that. Um, the intent generally is that we want to protect fasteners, i.e. the welds, and, and develop or, or uh, cause yielding to occur in the base material. So certainly fillet welds can be larger than, than the plate thickness. Um, and another question uh, for you, Patrick. What if stiffeners are used near the bolt locations to reduce flange bending? Um, so I think we're, we're talking about prying action in that case. And yeah. that's, that's absolutely true. Um, in, in fact, that's the common, common practice, right? If you need to increase capacity or you can't get the load out uh, using the prying equations, and you're getting to prohibitive thicknesses, then often it's a better solution to just put stiffeners in to eliminate that. Um, now, the, the, the uh, development of hinges or force transfer when you introduce those stiffeners then requires its, its own assumptions as far as the force distribution. Um, often you're into a yield line theory type of approach, and you know for end plates, um, there are AISC design guides that do a great job of, of uh, presenting that. Great. Okay, thank you. And then we have a question for, um, I guess, Larry or Patrick or both of you. Uh, 
Um, the question is that uh, this participant says that in a steel interchange um, article in Modern Steel Construction, uh, the steel ultimate strength was used rather than the yield strength um, on the thickness. Can you comment uh, on that? Uh, and this would be for uh, the prying equations. Not, I'm not sure which. Uh, oh, for the prying equations. Then um, F F sub U is what's used in the manual, um, and that's that's what should be used. And that can be a little confusing because the P factor. Uh, is what you would expect to be used with a yield material limit state, um, but really that that's been manipulated. And Larry, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but what Swanson's paper really showed was that um, because you are bending the material, uh, you do move up on the curve and reliably up on the curve into um, strengths that are higher than yield, and and we can count on those. Um, so really, that that was just a calibration to the test data. Yeah, one of one of the theories on that is that because we're we're bending about the weak axis of so that element, it's it's very stable, and we're we're probably getting in this we're getting some strain hardening um, out of the material. So it like Patrick just said, it's calibrated to the tests, and so we we get a better prediction of the strength relative to the test data if we use F sub U instead of F sub Y. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, this question is for Larry on slide 39. Is there any lab data for this kind of connection um, and failure or a failure pattern? Yes. Yeah, so the, the 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 actually the, the research that's cited there uh, that was done at McGill included uh, physical tests of these connections, and they they. They find that well, the failure mode is going to depend on on what's the governing limit state. So presumably that that added weld there has been designed to to just take the the load, and then you would probably what I've recommended in the past is that you also do a check to make sure that the weld um, is at least as strong as the the flexural strength of that plate, similar to what you would do on the the the, the shop weld or on those field bolts, typically. Um, and so the, the failure mode would probably end up being within the plate, the, the predicted failure mode. Uh, but those physical test data can be downloaded uh, from McGill. Okay, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I think this one's directed to Patrick, but of course Larry is there, so you know if you would like to answer. If a full penetration weld fails a UT test. Can a fillet weld be added to compensate, and then uh, consider the weld to be a partial pen weld with a fillet weld? You know that's that's a great question, um, and I can only offer opinion on that. Um, the the thing that gets a little fussy is now you've got a weld that you know has an inclusion, and where is that inclusion? The 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 fussy part is what can you count on as an effective throat for the PJP? Um, I think that's where it gets a little dicey, but I think in theory you could absolutely do that. Um, Larry, you have other thoughts on that? No, I, I, I agree with what you just said. Okay, great. Um, well, unfortunately that's all the time we have today for questions. If your question did not get answered, we'll try to reach you by email with a response.